Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5. If for no other reason, just to find it. Micah chapter 5. Now, when we're talking about Micah and going through the passages of Scripture, walking together with Micah all the way to the New Jerusalem, this is what God has in mind. God has in mind that we take on the prophets. We take on these minor prophets in which we've been reading and, and experiencing their world, their lives, what they wrote. And it's part of the journey of the Scripture. Uh, remember I showed you the, or told you about the times where I used to read about the prophets, and I used to think, why would you ever read these guys? And you would try to get through them as fast as possible. Well, they have a lot to share with us, and they have a lot out to say. Let's read together the first couple of, past, uh, couple of verses of chapter 5. Now, muster yourself in troops, daughters of troops. They have laid a siege against us. With a rod, they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. But as for you, Bethlehem of Ephrata, too little to be, uh, to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. His going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Obviously, you've read that verse, and you would have thought Christmas is in about Christmas in about three months. That is one of the most famous passages in all the world. It's a prophecy regarding the coming of Jesus. Now, many of the things that are in the Scripture is prophecy. About 30% of the Bible is biblical prophecy, about 30%. That means that it explains to, the, to us the future in advance. Some of, that his, some of that prophecy is history for us. Okay, So some of that prophecy is already history, meaning that it has already been fulfilled. It has already been fulfilled. So 30% of the Bible is biblical prophecy, meaning it, it, it gave us the future in advance. And out of those 30%, a uh, large portion of it has already been fulfilled, meaning that it's already history. So now we, can, we have the great advantage to look back in history and to see what the prophets wrote in advance and see whether or not it happened in history. Okay, so what we have left is quite a bit of prophecy, but uh, dealing mainly with the return of Jesus, dealing mainly with the return of the Lord, the, the signs of his coming and what will be uh, the earth will be like um, before his return. And, of course, we have prophecies about his kingdom uh, that will be on the earth. But the, uh, but the world's always been fascinated with the future. Anybody know who this lady is? No? Anybody have, want to take a guess? Her name is Jane Dixon. Jane Dixon was a very, very famous um, astrologer, prophet, um, you know, sort of one of the prophets. He... I believe she's the one that foretold the assassination of Kennedy. Um, she got some things right, but most of it wrong. Um, like all the Serp for Clean Prophets. Anybody know who this guy is? It says in the back. Nostradamus, right? Very, uh, right around December 28, 29, you start seeing a lot of this guy on the newsstands and on the, uh, you know, world, the, uh, the History Channel because, you know, oh, he talked about the year 2018. He talked about this. And... You can just Google Nostradamus prophecies 2017, and there's always someone who's going to come up with something about he predicted this, he predicted that. But has anyone ever read Nostradamus? Has anyone here ever dived into it? Okay, sort of. You know, I read some of the stuff about him, and you know, because I wanted to read, I was interested. Did he really prophesy about Hitler? You know, <laughs> Nostradamus is like this. It's so ambiguous. You can make it sound like whatever you want. So he wrote the name Hister, and so in one of his prophecies, you know, he's going to come to Hister, and it, and it was like, well, and then most of the stuff about Nostradamus is by people who read into his writings and come up with prophecies. He never really, I mean, he, he was a diviner. Uh, he was an occultist. He would read into um, a um, sort of like a crystal ball, you know, basically like a clear dish, and he would read... Or, or see images in this uh, sort of clear dish, sort of like a crystal ball is what they use. Now, Jane Dixon was also a psychic. And um, anybody know who this guy is? He was from a church. He was a, a Sunday school teacher. Very well known. Wow. 
Mr. Edgar Casey. Mr. Edgar Casey was a Sunday school teacher. He was a Baptist Sunday school teacher, I believe. I might be, you know, maybe giving Baptist a bad name, but um, he was a Baptist Sunday school teacher, I think. Might have been Presbyterian, but um, he would go into trances, and he was called a sleeping prophet because he would uh, go into trances, he would fall asleep, and he would wake up with these dreams and visions, and so he had been predicting an earthquake in San Francisco for 70 years, and you know, the California was just split off into the ocean, all these things. Now, uh, most of the stuff, of course, he's wrong. These things never happened. Uh, these were time-specific events that he talked about. Uh, but on and on and on it goes. You know, Dionne Warwick with the uh, Psychic Channel and things like that, which went bankrupt. You would imagine, being psychic, you would have seen it coming. and You would have just packed up and, and left, but they, they kept going and they went bankrupt. But God is the only one that can actually predict history. He's the only one that can actually predict history exactly how it's going to happen, exactly how it's going to happen. Now, people are fascinated with the future. That's why they paid a lot of money for tarot cards, a lot of money for psychics, a lot of money for automatic writing and crystal balls and crystal gazing and astrology and trying to predict events based on you know, uh, constellations and things like that. That just didn't happen now. It always happened it's always happened, and God's people have always been involved. In fact, at the time of Micah, and here's a, here's a picture of Micah where he was from. He was from the area near Jerusalem. Um, Amos, Micah, Hosea, Isaiah were all from that same area. But Micah was from the lower countries, right? Remember the, the Shephelah? He was from the Shephelah. He was from the poor country. He would have been the lower class guys. Farmer, you would say. Somebody who worked on the field. And I've shown you some of the pictures of how the Shephelah uh, looks like today. It's on the lower hills of Jerusalem. And God has told us in advance through the prophets things that will happen. Now, the word prophecy has to do with the future, but it has to do more with the forth telling of God's word. Many of the prophets' writings do not necessarily have to do with the future. In fact, when you read Micah, some of it is the future, some of it is the current situation that they were living in. So this is how we look at prophecy in the Bible. When the prophet would speak, he would speak of his own time. He would speak of the time of Jesus, his first coming. But he would also have these incredible verses about the, the second coming of Jesus, the new Jerusalem that's coming, right? And sometimes, even within the same chapter, or the same verse, or the same context, this is why biblical prophecy um, it's one of the hardest things to learn or understand or discern through the scripture because they happen sometimes within the same passage. And you have to be a good Bible student and defer or, or uh, separate those things. All right, so I'll give you a couple of examples when we get to it. Uh, but God has given us fair warning of what's coming ahead. He doesn't tell us exactly what's going to happen every time, but he does tell us in a major nutshell what will happen. I think if God would tell us in advance what exactly would happen every single day, we wouldn't even get out of bed. All the challenges that we face. And if God would have told me what would happen today, I probably wouldn't have gotten into work today. Just on the basis of the fact that I would have been too anxious or too frightened to even face it. But yet again, God tells us future events and things to be looking out for. So this is Micah. Micah has, you would say, a telescope or a binoculars in this case, and when you look at binoculars or telescope, if you look through them, this is fascinating, this is true, when you look at faraway things, they seem to be very close to other faraway things, but in reality, they're quite a bit distant apart, meaning that if you were to look at a mountain range, um, you can look at a mountain range and you could see that, well, maybe that mountain is close to the other mountain. And you get close, and you get close, and you realize that mountain's really far away from it. And there's like a valley in between. And there's another lower hill that I couldn't see because I wasn't close enough to that mountain. That's how prophecies are in the scriptures. There are verses that have the same, in the same verse, same passage, two prophecies. And you go, man, that's going to happen like back to back, right? And then you see it worked out in the life of Jesus, and you say, that's not the case. It's like 2,000 years apart. 
it's like a mountain. There was a mountain, a valley, another mountain, maybe a little lower hill, but then you got to the big mountain, right? So let's look how this works in Scripture. Look at Isaiah 61. I hope, I don't, I hope I'm not going to regret this, but let's go to Isaiah 61 because I, I want to get to the, the chapter because it's fascinating. The king of Israel... And what do you think of the Jewish people? That's the title of the message. The king of Israel, what do you think about the Jewish people? Now, Isaiah 61 is a classic example, many guys have known this, of two prophecies that are thousands of years apart. Jesus walked into Nazareth in Luke chapter 4, and a scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he turned, not he didn't turn the book, but he went to that passage of Scripture uh, there was no chapter divisions, there were no verses on it. He simply went to the scroll, opened it up, and went exactly to that passage. That means, that will tell me that Jesus knew the book of Isaiah quite well. How would you find Isaiah 61 if, you didn't, if there was no numbers on it? Would anyone here know? Does anyone, <laughs> I don't want to put this to the test, but does anyone know the context of Isaiah 61? Does anyone know the part of the book of Isaiah that Isaiah 61 belongs to. Okay. Does anyone know the part of the book of Isaiah that this, you know, a major part of the book of Isaiah that this passage belongs to, right? It'll be hard to find for us Isaiah 61. But if you were to say, okay, it's on the second half of Isaiah, then you'd be on the right track. Okay, it's not the first, it's 66 chapters, right? And it's not on the first section, it's on the second section of Isaiah, which begins in chapter 40. And chapter 61 has to do with the Messiah coming to the earth. Now, let's read it together. And Jesus has handed this, and it says, The Spirit of the Lord, is, uh, of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring the good news to the afflicted, has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now, Jesus stopped right there. You can look at Luke chapter 4 on your own time, or do it now, but Jesus stopped right there. He closed the book, he closed the scroll, I can't say book, they had scrolls, and handed it to the attendant, handed it back. And he said, today, what you heard is fulfilled. What did he mean by that? Well, that the Spirit of God had anointed him. He was the Messiah. To do what? To bring the good news, Besorah, right? The good news, the, the gospel, to the afflicted, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captains, freedom to the prisoners, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Meaning God is accepting people. God is accepting. It's the day uh, that God will accept people into his kingdom, the acceptable year of the Lord. Don't worry about the word year. It has to do with the time, the acceptable time that the Lord will be accepting his people. Did that happen at the time of Jesus? Of course, right? He said, that which you read, that which you heard is fulfilled in your ears. What didn't Jesus say about that verse in Isaiah? Did he miss one part? Verse 2, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He stopped there. He did not read... And the day of vengeance of our God, to come for all who mourn, to grant those who mourn and born in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of the spirit of fainting, so they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. The day of vengeance of our God. And then he goes on to the kingdom of God. The day of vengeance. What is the day of vengeance of God? The book of Revelation calls it the day of wrath, the day of God's wrath or the wrath of the Lamb, right? The wrath of the Lamb. It is the day that God will bring retribution to a Christ-rejecting sinful world. That's the day of wrath. Um, believers will escape the day of wrath, but unbelievers, along with the Antichrist and Satan himself, will be, will be going through the book of, uh, will go through the day of vengeance and the day of wrath and eventually will lead into the lake of fire. But that is the day of wrath. Did that happen the first time Jesus came? Of course not, right? But it's within the same, it's the same verse. How long are they apart? It's been 2,000 years at least, right? 
Same verse, same context, 2,000 years apart. Okay, here's another one, Joel chapter 2. Joel says, the, uh, God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Uh, young men will see visions, old men will see dreams, and God will pour out his spirit. And it'll be a wonderful time where God will, uh, God's spirit will be able to be prophesied. Uh, God's spirit will come upon people to prophesy, and they will speak the word of God forth with power. And Peter says in Acts 2, that which Joel said, it's happening now. And you say, hallelujah, Joel's fulfilled. Wait a minute. Keep reading Joel 2. It says there'll be pillars of smoke. The sun will turn into darkness and the moon into blood. It'll be fire, brimstone. Man, that didn't happen in, Joel, in Acts chapter 2. Same passage. That's the day of the Lord, again. The day of the Lord and the, uh, the preaching of the gospel in Acts 2, all in the same passage of Joel 2, but separated by 2,000 years. Right? So you walk up to Joel 2 and you say, man, those two mountains look really close. The Spirit of the Lord coming upon people and the day of wrath. But when you get to that passage and you read Acts and you say, that didn't happen, and you read the book of Revelation, and say, oh, that's when it happens, you see that it's apart by 2,000 years. Does that make any sense to everybody? Okay. It's in the same context, same passage, same verse, thousands of years apart. Okay, that's how the prophet saw. The prophet saw it like this. Oh, there's two mountains. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it looks like one mountain. <laughs> And then you get up close, oh my goodness, it's two mountains. And they're not even close together, all right? Prophecy is like that in the scriptures. And here's one passage, so go back to Micah. Here's one passage where it's just like that. We're going to talk about the Lord's kingdom that's going to come. We're going to talk about Israel's exile. Jesus is coming the first time. Uh, Israel's second exile, and then Jesus coming again for them and establishing his kingdom, all within one chapter. Talk about a synopsis of, of the scriptures, right? Now let's read it again. Verse 1, Now you muster yourselves in troops, daughter of troops, that they all have laid siege against us. With the rod they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. But as for you, Bethlehem of Ephrata, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you will come forth for me the ruler of Israel, and is going forth as from long ago, from the days of eternity. So verse 1, look at it this way. Verse 1, it's really low. It's a valley. I'm going to go back to that. Chris, let's go back to that one. It's a valley. It's low. Israel is going to be exiled, kicked out. Verse 2, a peak, <laughs> a big peak. The Messiah is born. Verse 3, it's a plain. Nothing happens in the plain. Just seems like it goes on forever. Verse 4 to 15, another mountain, a big mountain, but it's a head. It's the kingdom of God. So Micah sees this book, or you can look at this book that Micah wrote, this chapter, and you can look at it as a valley, a peak, a plain, and another mountain way up ahead. Israel's kicked out of the land. Jesus comes, the plane. Nothing happens to Israel for quite a bit of time, right? When you're in a plane, it just seems like you're walking forever. It's like driving through Texas. Nothing, nothing. You just, I did it. You just drive, you just drive, nothing. Then here comes a mountain, and it's a big one because it covers the entire kingdom of God. It covers the, the coming of Jesus and the setting up of God's kingdom. So let's, let's get into Micah. A siege is going to happen. Remember, Micah wrote to... The southern kingdom. So we're going to put the northern kingdom on the shelf for a little bit. So just take it on your mind and put it on the shelf. And says, okay, I'm not going to worry about the northern kingdom right now. They're going to be gone in, according to Micah's timeline, maybe in about 15, 20 years when Micah was writing. Hosea warned about it. Amos wrote about it. Assyria was going to come, and it's not going to be happy. It's going to be destruction. The Assyrian Empire is going to come, and they're going to destroy the northern kingdom. But the southern kingdom lived on for about 100 and some years later. 150 some years later, the, um, the northern kingdom was destroyed. Um, sorry, uh, 100, 100 some years later, the southern kingdom is destroyed this time by Babylon. And it says in verse 1 that there's a siege against us, and they will smite the judge of Israel uh, on the cheek. There is a siege. Now, I don't know if anybody's had been... Any, 
Oh, sounds like a silly question. Has anyone here been in a siege? <laughs> oh, Americans, how easy has been, right? I have never been to one specifically, but I do remember something that happened when I was a kid. I grew up in Nicaragua, as you guys, many of you guys would know, and there was a civil war. And I remember, uh, as a kid, not being able to go in certain areas because it was surrounded by the army. And uh, there was a rebel group that was coming in and had surrounded the city, and no food can come in, and no food, or no one can get out, and no one can get in, and no food can get in, uh, obviously, no water, no food, no resources can get in until the siege was done, until the army got rid of the rebel groups. It was scary as a kid. Nonetheless, I, you know, I still remember it. You know, I just hear shooting, pop, 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 you know, and people screaming and people rioting and people try to break into homes, and, and that's what happened. But none like this, none like this. So I, I can't relate to it that much, but I could tell you that it's really quite scary to think about that your home could be the next home that some group is going to come in and besiege it and take, you know, take your sister, take your mom, take somebody, shoot them, or whatever the case may be, and you're just hoping it's not your house. Now, in Israel, this happened. Babylon came, and Nebuchadnezzar surrounded the city, and there was a siege on the city of Jerusalem. Now, there had been a siege around Jerusalem at the time of Hezekiah. Remember the story of Hezekiah? He prayed because uh, the Assyrian Empire had come, right? Sennacherib had surrounded the city, and he prayed. He went before the Lord, and God spared Jerusalem because one man prayed. Encouragement to us, right? If one of us pray, God can answer a prayer of one person and save a city. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us through the prayer of one man, you can save your city. You can save your neighborhood. You can save your family. You can save your city if a man dedicates himself to prayer. But it has to be the prayer of the righteous, right? James tells us that. Uh, the prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much, avails much. But Israel was captivated. So let's go to the book of Kings. Let's go to 1 Kings. Let's go to the book of Kings. 1 Kings. And let's go to the end of the book. Let's go to the end of the book of Kings and find out exactly what happened to Israel because it tells us exactly what will happen. Uh, I'm sorry, 2 Kings. 2 Kings. Chapter 25. Now, this is what happened to Jerusalem. This is what happened to what Micah is saying prophetically, the book of Kings tells us historically. 2 Kings 25. In the ninth year of his reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, exactly, we know exactly when it is. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his army against Jerusalem, and camped against it, and built a siege wall all around it. Built a siege wall all around it. King Nebuchadnezzar laid a siege. And it says, uh, verse 2, So the city was under siege until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. Okay, so the ninth year of his reign, on the 10th month, uh, so the city was under siege until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe that the city, uh, in the city that there was no food for the people, of the land. That's a bad siege. Now, whenever you see a siege, whether it's Samaria, whether it's Jerusalem, twice, one by the, by the Babylonians, one by the Romans, it's a picture of the end of the world. It's a picture of the end of the age, as to say. Not the end of the world. The end of the age. Jerusalem will be surrounded again. Judah will be surrounded again. This time, it's not going to be by the Romans or the Babylonians. It will be by the armies of Antichrist. And it'll come from the north. It'll come from the north, from the area of the Valley of Megiddo. Let's say it again. It's the uh, Tel Megiddo. It's the, it's the mountain of Megiddo, but it's the Valley of Jezreel coming down the north, going south from the north onto Jerusalem. The battle will spill, and Jerusalem will be under siege. The city will be divided. Jews will be kicked out. That's what Zechariah says. So this is a picture. What happened here, it's going to be a picture of the time of the Great Tribulation. Very much a picture. The siege, remember in the, if you read uh, Josephus, Flavius Josephus, it tells you what happened, what the Romans did. Almost exactly the same thing. They surrounded the city, they built a siege. Famine was so severe, even people were eating uh, the afterbirth. People were having babies, 
and they were eating the afterbirth because there was nothing to eat. I think that's gross, but uh, when a famine is so severe, you'll eat anything. That's exactly what happened. In fact, they have done a lot of excavation. This is, this is why I get in trouble. <laughs> they had a lot of excavation in terms of what happened during that time, the time of the Babylonians. They have found toilets where people were actually uh, had gone to the bathroom. And they have found bacteria in, in, in some of these toilets. Fascinating. And uh, the bacteria, obviously intestinal bacteria, they can trace it back, and they can tell what people ate during this time. Guess what they found? They didn't find that people were living lavishly and eating five-course meals and things like that. They found in the, 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 the residue, basically people being starved, malnourished, people eating grass, literally the grass off the field. They didn't have anything else to eat. And archaeologists said something really bad happened here where people were actually eating this kind of food. The siege. It fits perfectly with biblical history. No doubt. You know, who knew that archaeology in a, in a toilet would actually uh, get to the point where you could actually prove something so simple that the Bible said, well, that's, it proves what the Scripture says. If you have to go that deep, but it's actually true. People at the time were in a severe famine. It actually tells us, right? Severe city. There was no food for the people. Verse 4. Then the city was broken into, and all the men of war fled by night the way of the gate between the two walls besides the king's garden. Though the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, were all around the city, they went by the way of Arabah. Okay, so this is Zedekiah and his, and his main troops. They, um, they went through the area of Arabah, and uh, they were captured eventually. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. This is right outside Jerusalem. Before you head down 1,500 feet below sea level to the Dead Sea, they were caught right there, about a day's journey from Jerusalem by foot. And all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him to the king of Babylon at Riblah. This is Nebuchadnezzar. And he passed sentence on him. And they slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and then put the eyes out of Zedekiah and bound them with bronze fetters and brought him to Babylon. Exactly what Micah said. Let's go back to Micah. Let's see what he said. Well, that's the history. Micah wrote this in advance. He said, this is what's going to happen to the judge of Israel. With a the rod, they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. They're going to inflict, inflict, the judge of Israel. Israel's going to be besieged, right? They laid a siege, verse 1, against us. With the rod, they'll smite the judge of Israel. Micah sees this in advance. This is so awful. This is our king. This is our judge. All jurisdiction, civil law was done through the king. So 2 Kings is later than Micah. Micah writes in advance what will happen in the kings. The book of Kings gives us the history. This is exactly what happened. So verse 1, Fulfilled to the T. It even tells you what's going to happen to the king. The judge of Israel, they're going to smite him. They're going to smite him and they're going to take him into captivity. Well, he did go into captivity. Now, that's the valley, a very, very low point. But just lift up your eyes. Verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem of Ephrata, too little among the clans of Judah, one will go forth for me, the ruler of Israel. His going forth are from long ago, from eternity. Micah sees something. He sees the valley and it says it's awful. Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. But just look up. There's a baby. There's a baby that's coming. Now, whenever a baby's coming, is a happy occasion. Right, Rebecca? It's a happy occasion. Yeah. Baby Shlomo's coming. It's a very happy occasion. Well, there's no more happiness than this verse right here. <laughs> There's a baby's going to be born. The one quoted in Matthew, the best known village in the world, Bethlehem. Bethlehem. House, Bethlehem, bread. The house of bread. Now, when you go to Bethlehem today, it doesn't look anything like the house of bread, and there's an interesting reason why. But this house of bread, a tiny little village, so small, it wasn't even counted. It was barely counted among the census in Israel. In fact, in order to be a village, you need to have at least 1,000 families in this place, in a village. According to history, Bethlehem was barely 1,000. 
Too little among the clans of Judah. It's barely made the list. You're not the least. Barely made it. Um, why would God want to do that? <laughs> uh, why would God want to have his king born there? We'll explain that more as we go. Now, there was two, uh, two Bethlehems. In fact, God has to make it so specific that it has to tell you when, when, where it is. There was two. One in Judea, the one we're talking about, and one in Galilee, where they were. God says it's not the one, <laughs> not the one in Galilee. That was the most famous one. A lot of people there. It was actually the one, Ephrata, right by Jerusalem, just outside Jerusalem. It's called Ephrata, too little among. The greatest king of Israel was born there. Anybody know who was born there? It's called the city of the great king. David Melech, right? King David was born there. Just read the book of Samuel. It tells you he was born there. And so Bethlehem was famous because they had given birth to the greatest king of Israel. But did David stay there? A little shepherd boy grew up there fighting against Goliath. No, he became the king. And he moved his uh, location to Jerusalem. It was the golden age of Israel, right? Expanded. It's grown. Him and his son Solomon, it, it basically grew as the largest it's ever been since the promise of God to Abraham. Uh, but 300 years after David, Micah sees something else. Right? Bethlehem had gone into obscurity again. David was born there, hooray, hooray, but he moved to Jerusalem, and then the kingdom fell. 300 years later, Micah sees something. There's a king going to be born there, another king. And this time, it's going to be not just a king, but one that comes from eternity. We'll talk about that in a moment. How did Jesus get born there? That's the interesting part. Um, how did Jesus end up being born in Bethlehem? Now, only God could have done that, right? God could have had him born anywhere in the world, the Roman Empire, many wonderful cities at the time, Babylon, could have been born in anywhere, but he had to be born in the city of David, right? What brought Jesus' family to Bethlehem? Anybody know? That's right. What was the census for? A tax. Don't ever get mad at your taxes. It brought Jesus into the world. One tax brought Jesus. I don't like to pay taxes, but I, I have to. But think about this prophetically, it brought Jesus to Bethlehem to fulfill the scripture. It was a tax. 500 miles away, this Roman emperor had a great idea. You know, we need more money. More money to finance wars. More. I know, let's tax the Jews. Well, how are you going to get them down there? I know, Let, let's make everybody go back to their hometown. Remember, they were, they were from Galilee. They were in the area, northern area of Galilee, but Mary and Joseph were from the tribe uh, of Judah, they were from the line of David. They had to go back to their family town, Bethlehem. And, and Mary goes on this trek right up from Galilee all the way down to Jerusalem. And then the baby cried. And there was a wonderful star. And then they named him Jesus because he would save his people from their sin. What a wonderful passage, isn't it? That Jesus will be born there, right? But this prophecy was really hard, wasn't it? Because something else happened. Does anyone know, wonderful Bible scholars, you, does anyone know what happened after this joyous occasion? Jesus is born, the Magi show up, we need to see the king of the Jews, right? We need to see, come, we come to see the king of the Jews. The shepherds show up and all this stuff. And then Herod does something awful. What does he do? Kills all the babies, right? Two and under, right? Um, again, the spirit the spirit of that age, to kill babies. Just like in Moses' time, the Egypt, kill all the baby Jews. Um, same thing with Haman, same thing with Obama, same thing with Hillary, same thing with the Clintons. Just the same type of spiritual battle, same type of spirit to kill babies. At that time, it was the time of Jesus coming. So there's a joy and a sorrow. When Jesus will come, when he's getting close to come, there'll be this, this battle that happening and babies will be at stake. Um, somebody told Jesus that he couldn't be the Messiah. They said, I thought the Messiah was supposed to be from Bethlehem, but you're from Nazareth. Do you know what Jesus said? Anyone know? It's not like a rhetorical question. <laughs> he said nothing. Why didn't he say anything? Well, for many, many years, it was established already that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. 
whoever this was, was the Messiah. And everybody knew Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but they didn't believe him. He was from Nazareth. He says, you're not, you're not the Messiah. Now the Targum, Targum Jonathan, which is a, a very, very important Targum, these are like uh, commentaries. It speaks that Micah 5.2 is clearly about the Messiah. Clearly about the Messiah. In fact, you can read uh, Micah 5.2 and just say, look, this, this Messiah is going to be forth for God, ruler of Israel, his going forth are from long ago, from eternity. Whoever's going to be born there is going to be, he's already existed. That's what it's saying. Whoever's going to be born has already existed. I don't know if Micah even understood what he was writing. Because if you look at it, his going forth, someone's going to be born whose days are from eternity. He's already existed, and then he's going to be born. It's fascinating. Plus, the book of Micah, uh, it's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Septuagint uh, was known to Jeremiah. Remember we read that passage a few weeks ago? Jeremiah was about to get killed. He was in prison, was about to get killed, and some of the elders were there, and he's like, wait, 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 don't kill him. You know, there was a guy named Micah who prophesied a long time ago, and it said that this would happen... Israel was going to be, Jerusalem was going to be plowed. Uh, don't kill him. <laughs> don't kill him because he's saying the same thing that Micah said. Just let him live, right? Micah was well known. This is not an obscure passage. What's fascinating to me is that after 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed. Uh, Bethlehem became basically an unknown city. And um, it's actually an Arab village today. I don't, have a pro I don't have a picture of it today. I should have brought one. Uh, but Bethlehem of Ephrata was promised the prince of peace, right? Uh, little among the cl clans of Judah, he was going to bring the peace. There's no peace. No Jewish family lives in Bethlehem today. Very little, if any. Uh, it's, it's a Muslim city. Now, think about this for a moment. No one, no Jew can ever be born in Bethlehem and claim that passage. Not now. There's only one person that can fit that. It's only Jesus. If ever if somebody says, you know, they, they use this passage. Christians began to preach the gospel and preach this passage. Uh, and the Jews began to get worried about this because they said, boy, it sounds a lot like Jesus. Let's change this. And they began to downplay the idea that, oh, Jesus wasn't born there and things like that. And then it happened that 70 AD came and it wiped all of that area away. No Jews lived there. Even to this day, there are very, very little Jews that have ever lived in Bethlehem after 70 AD. No one can ever claim Micah 5.2 anymore. See how important it is? No, no Jew will ever be born there that would claim what Jesus did or what, what, what Jesus said he, he would be the Messiah because there's nobody that's going to live there. It's all Muslim country now. So Jesus was fits perfectly within the context of prophecy because no Jew is going to be born there. At least for right now, there's not going to be any prophetic significance to Bethlehem. Bethlehem's significance ended when Jesus was born to tell us that he's the only one that can fit into that passage. Now, let's continue because we only got to verse 3. And we're a half hour in. Uh, his days are from eternity. His days are from long ago, just like John 1.1, 1, 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? Uh, Charles Wesley, right? Wonderful song about Jesus being incarnate, God becoming a man. Verse 3 says this. Okay, so you now we hit the peak again. We hit the peak. We hit the valley. We hit the peak. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she is in labor, um, when she is in labor, has born a child, then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. Micah sees beyond verse 2 and now says, something's going to happen. God is going to give them up. God is going to give them up. Now that sounds, almost sounds so different, isn't it? Wait a minute, the Messiah has come. Why would God give them up now? Why would God give them up until the time? It, it is an interesting verse. It's saying, basically, the Messiah is going to come, and God's going to give them up. Now, what happened in Jewish history 
which caused the separation of God and Israel after Jesus was born. What happened? What's that? His death. His death. What happened to the Jewish people after his death and resurrection? Some believed. Some rejected. Many believed. Many, most of them rejected. What happened to the nation of Israel after Jesus was born, died, and rose again? 70 A.D. Is Israel separated from God now? Oh, yeah. Still happened to this day. This is the plane. We're going to hit a long plane, uh, meaning that nothing's going to happen. Israel was almost unheard of at the time. Remember the wandering Jew and things like that? Israel went to every part of the land, away from the land, away from their God, away from their king. What happened? Who took their place? Gentiles and believing Jews, right? The body of Christ came. Now, it's fascinating to me to think about this. I, 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 you know, my family's born into, uh, uh, married into a Jewish family, but that's, far, that's as far as it goes. Gentile as Gentile can get. But I'm talking to you tonight, mostly Gentiles. I you know, hear Jewish family, you know, maybe. Uh, from a Jewish book about Jewish things, <laughs> right? From a Jewish book about a Jewish Messiah, about Jewish things, from a Jewish guy, Micah, right? How did that happen? <laughs> how did that happen? You'd be reading, you know, Viking stories or something like that, right? That's how, <laughs> Gentiles, that's, you know, Mexican stories or something like that. But no, we're reading a Jewish book about a Jewish God and a Jewish Messiah who we claim he's our Lord. How did that happen? Well, Micah said, God is going to give them up until a time. But look what verse 3 says. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. He will return to the sons of Israel. He give, didn't give him up forever. <laughs> There's a hope they're going to come back. The plane took a long time. <laughs> 70 AD, 2007, uh, 1948, 1967, 1973, and all the way down there, the Jewish people have been flooding Israel. From all over the nations, from all over the world, different cultures, Russian Jews, Argentinian Jews, Venezuelan Jews, Mexican Jews, Spanish Jews, European Jews, Australian Jews, all of that culture, all of their background coming in, and they didn't even speak the same language. They all spoke English, you know, I was going to say Australian, sorry, David. They speak English, they speak all kinds of different languages, Spanish, they had no way to communicate. So what did they do? You know, King David spoke a beautiful language. Hebrew language. They resurrected it. They resurrected it. Nobody knew Hebrew when they got there. Everybody spoke English or, or Russian or, or something of that, or European, German, Yiddish. They took old Hebrew. They never learned. They never, nobody really practiced it. And they developed the language. And they began to speak to each other now. And so God has taken Gentiles and put them in a place where he can work through the body of Christ, Jew and Gentile together, and brought the Jewish people back to the land. So now, parallel to the body of Christ, there's the nation of Israel. Just to let us know, God is not done with his people, right? And it's describing these amazing events. I mean, you're looking at history. I mean, we just read three verses, but it's thousands of years of history, right? Jesus comes. Um, that, uh, the Romans come. They destroyed the, the nation. Uh, they're scattered all around. The gospel goes to the ends of the earth. People preach the gospel. Jewish people come to know the Lord. For the most part, there's no Israel for thousands of years. Until 1948, God begins to bring them back. And he's going to bring them back, never to be uprooted again. Verse 4. And he will rise. He will arise and, and shepherd his flock. From verse 4 to 15, we hit a major peak now. We've seen the valley. We've seen a peak. We've seen the plain. Now we're coming up to the great mountain, verses 4 to 15. A period when the king of Israel, right, uh, when Israel becomes part of the kingdom of God. The day of rebirth, right? The day of rebirth, the hope. He will shepherd his flock, right? In the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, they will remain because at the time he will be great to the ends of the earth, that he is the Messiah. This one will be our peace. 
is going to be the peace. The peace of Israel. Why haven't they had peace? Because they have not come to the shepherd. Right? Remember the, the, the prophecy of Micah 2? The shepherd's going to come and he's going to break through. Perez, right? Perez is going to break through the bridge or the, the, where they're enclosed and he's going to lead them out. And they're going to follow the king and they're going to follow the shepherd. Jesus will come and they're going to lead the Jewish people out. Out of the bondage of the law, out of the, the law of sin and death, but their inability to keep the law. Now, praise be the Lord that us Gentiles, that's with, us without the law, but under the law of sin and death, we were, you know, we were without law, without the law of, uh, of Moses, but yet under the law of sin and death, because we sin, Jesus leads us out. But then the Jewish people who have the oracles of God, Romans 1 tells us, who have all the advantages, right? All the advantages. When a Jew comes to know Jesus, he has a lot more advantages than us because he has been steeped in the Old Testament, Jewish history, Jewish culture. By the way, everything biblical is Jewish, by the way. Everything biblical is Jewish. But not everything is Jewish is biblical. You have to make that very, very much a clear distinction. Everything that's biblical is Jewish, no doubt, no doubt. But not everything that's Jewish is biblical. Does that make sense? Okay, people get into all kinds of, you know, extreme Jewish things, and they claim that they're, you know, all of a sudden they're following Jesus, and they're following, basically, Talmud Judaism. Not biblical, but they claim to be following Judaism. But everything that is biblical is Jewish. So he's their peace. This one will be our peace. Why isn't there peace in Israel? Because they're not embracing Jesus yet. Why isn't there peace in the world? Because Jesus hasn't been embraced completely. He's been rejected, right? Um, he's the shepherd. Moses, David, they're all shepherds. Isaiah 2 tells us he will feed the flock, care and protect his people, and he will say, peace, peace, shalom, right? If Jesus was here with us today, which he is, but he's physically here, he would say to us, peace, shalom. Remember when he appeared to the disciples? And they were frightened. But he said what? Shalom Aleichem. Peace be unto you. I'm here. It's me. Don't be frightened. Right? Jesus is always trying to calm his people, bring them peace. Verse 6. Now things change a little bit here. I'm sorry, verse 5. When the Assyrians invade our land, when he tramples on our citadels, then we will rise against them. Seven shepherds and eight leaders of men. They will, shepherd the land, uh, they will shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword, the land of Nimrod at his entrances, and he will deliver us from the Assyrian when he attacks our land, when he tramples our territory. Micah sees further. Now, let's talk about the Assyrian Empire here, which was the major power of the day. Remember, Micah sees the future in his time about Babylon. Remember I told you about Babylon? At the time of Micah, Babylon was a little village in the Assyrian Empire. It wasn't even a powerful thing. It was just a little city in the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire was the one that was huge. But yet Micah sees future and sees Babylon coming. But he also sees the Assyrian. And what's interesting here is an invasion. There's an invasion that's going to happen. There's going to come. They're going to come and they're going to attack he will be great, I'm sorry, uh, verse 5, he will trample our citadels, he will rise against them, we will rise against them. The, when the Assyrian invades our land and he tramples our citadel. Won't have time, but you have to go to Daniel. Daniel 11 tells us about something about the Antichrist that's very much part of this passage. He comes to the beautiful land. He comes to attack Egypt. Ethiopia are not far from his reach. Edom and Moab are going to be spared. But then he, hears, <clears throat> then he hears news coming from the east. Could be the kings of the east. Could be. Daniel, we, we talked about Daniel 11 quite a bit. He comes to the south, and then he hears news coming from the east, and he goes back through Israel, and he engages in this battle, probably in the Valley of Jezreel, where the Armageddon scenario takes place. The Armageddon scenario is not just one battle, so it's a scenario. It's battles after battles that conclude in what we call the Battle of Armageddon. But the Assyrian, what's the Assyrian invasion? Scholars argue about this. 
But one thing they knew for sure, whoever the Assyrian is, sounds very conspicuously, sounds like the Antichrist, right? The Assyrian. He's going to come. He's going to go into the land. And it says they will rise up against him. The land of Nimrod in entrances. He will deliver us from the Assyrian. That's the Messiah. He will deliver us from uh, when he attacks our land, when he tramples our territory. Isn't that fascinating? The Assyrian. The Assyrian comes into the land of Israel. Daniel 11. But then Micah says, the Messiah will come, and he will deliver us from the Assyrian. Sounds a lot like 2 Thessalonians 2, doesn't it? With the brightness of his coming, he will destroy the Antichrist. Jesus will come, and with the brightness of his coming, he will destroy the one that will come against God's people. Verse 7, the remnant of Jacob will be among his people, like a dew from the Lord, like showers on vegetation, which do not wait for man or delay for the sons of man. The remnant of Jacob will be among the nations, among many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks of the sheep, which he passes through, tramples down in tears, and there's no one to rescue. Your hand will be lifted up against your adversaries, and all of your enemies will be cut off. The Jewish people are going to be like the dew, it says, in a water, uh, like water on a dry and thirsty land. It'll be a blessing to people. Be a blessing to people, like a, a, a morning dew on a dry land. But if people turn against them, if people turn against the Jewish people in the last days, God's going to give them the power to overcome those nations that come against them. You see the, the, see the verse there? If people turn against them, against the people, the Jewish people, God will make them like lions before their enemies. Fascinating, isn't it? Is that what we're witnessing today a little bit? Where you see this little nation of Israel and all these Muslim nations armed through the teeth and people are scared to death about going to war with Israel. Why? For some reason, in his purpose time, in, in purpose, uh, his perfect purpose and a uh, purpose in time, God has allowed them victory. 67 war, 73 war, war against Muslims, the, uh, the, the, the Fatah against Israel, have all failed, have all failed because God has given them victories time after time after time. I, I, it, would have, it would have filled my, uh, my PowerPoint today of newspaper clippings of Muslims saying, you know, we attacked Israel and it was like the rockets were heading, our rockets were being stir, steered away from Israel. One of them actually said, their God takes our rockets and puts them in the ocean. Uh, these are from like Muslim newspapers who are saying like, we can't attack Israel. Every time we attack them, something bad happens. They were launching an attack against Israel, and then this mysterious cloud came over right on the border of the Golan Heights, and nobody could do anything. They're just like, we can't attack. <laughs> Let's wait till tomorrow. And it was going to be a surprise attack, and they, they, it wasn't on the forecast, and all of a sudden this mysterious fog started showing up. Um, I don't remember the video, but it's a, it's a fascinating video. It's like a six-part series talking about the, the, the nation born in a day, the miracle of Israel, things that happen. Now, you, you guys be the judge of it. You guys watch it. But uh, accounts of military guys, soldiers, generals, uh, during the 67, 73 war, saying we, we could not have won unless there was a miracle. God was on our side. And these are atheist Jews who became, you know, at least theists in a sense of like they returned back to the Jewish God. There's no way we could have won. Uh, eyewitness accounts of people saying like, you know, we were walking through this desert and there was mines all over the place. We we're going to die. We didn't know where they were. And then a mysterious wind just showed up and it blew all that sand away. And we can tell where all the mines were and we can just walk right through them, through the, through the, uh, the Sinai. These are not my words. These are Israeli soldiers from the idea of saying something happens every time we go to battle. Now, this is fascinating to me because you think, well, God must be like, you know, for the Jewish people to kill people. I said, well, not exactly. God defends his people. Remember, he who, who, who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. When you come against the Jewish people, you're coming against the apple of his eye. You know, the apple of his eye is, the idea of an apple of his eye is the sensitive part, but it's also what you see, you know, it's like the apple of your eye, what do you have in vision? You know, you can see what's important to you. What do you focus on? 
Well, God's eye is on Israel. When you look at God's apple of his eye, you'll see Israel. You'll see his people. you see the church, right? So when you're coming against his people, you're coming against the apple of God's eyes. Now, let's continue because it gets very interesting here. Verse 10, in that day, declares the Lord, I will cut off from you horses from among you and destroy your chariots. God is not pleased with Israel trusting in horses and chariots. Remember the, the psalmist, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses. We will, re, we will trust in the name of our God. The kings were not allowed to have stables and horses, right? Because we were never, they were never to trust in military might. Uh, now, Solomon did something completely different. He, you can go to the ruins today. They found stables, hundreds and hundreds of stables of Solomon's stables. He did not practice what God told him not to do. Don't, don't, don't get horses. Don't get chariots. Don't trust in them. They're not your power. They're not military might. That's not your power. I'm your power. I'm your shield. I will be your great reward. That's what he told Abraham. Israel today trusts in their military power. Israel today, and they have a lot of it. You know, Technion, Hebrew University, amazing technology, one of the best technologies in the world. Uh, but they trust in it. Just like Jacob, they are trying to manipulate things to try to take advantage and, and, great, and, and get greater advantage. But God says, you know, I'm going to remove those things. My opinion, based on Scripture, um, I believe that before Jesus comes, Israel will be backed into a corner. I think they'll lose some battles. They'll, they'll have their, um, you know, their, their, uh, their pride be knocked down a few notches, and they will be to the point where they'll say, you know what, we can't defeat this. We, we've been defeating them, but we can't defeat them now. Something must give, and that's when the Lord's going to bring them to the point where the brink of extinction, and then they will say, okay, Lord, <laughs> you are God. Save us. Save us now. Hoshana, Hoshana, right? Save us now. They're going to get to that point where they'll be desperate. And it says there will be a purity among them. They were not going to be trusting chariots. They're not going to be trusting horses. The Jewish people have this great weakness. So does the church. They assimilate, they assimilate very well. They assimilate very well, meaning that they, they, they'll do what the pagans do. And every culture and everywhere the Jewish go, the Jewish people go, they become like the people that they're around. Now, this is in the Jewish minds in the Old Testament is not a racial, it's not a racial thing, it's a spiritual thing. In the New Testament, we're told to stay away from the world and the practices of the world and the philosophy of the world, not be conformed to this world, right, but to renew our minds by the word of God. We are not to be conformed to this world. It's the same idea. It's not a racial thing. It's a spiritual thing, right? The reason why we don't be they're not like the world is not, like, it's not, a, it's not a racial thing. It's not a discrimination thing. It's a purity thing. You know, we belong to Jesus. We belong to Christ. Um, the Jewish people have always adopted this, and they've always adopted, believe it or not, occult practices. Remember Isaiah chapter 8, all about occult practices and God condemning occult practices? And then Isaiah 9, Jesus comes, right? Isaiah 9 is the, the, the coming of the Messiah. It's trying to show that there's a relationship. When occult practices blossom among God's people, it always happens right before Jesus comes. It happened the first time Jesus came, and it's going to happen again before Jesus comes. God's people always like to get into pagan ideas. Now, the Jews had this, this incredible uh, knack for getting into pagan practices, witchcraft, occult power, spiritism. They had cloud readers. You know, you see, we have uh, you know, Christians, uh, you know, they, they look at the astrology and things like that to kind of determine what's going to happen. People look at all these September 23rd dates. It always happened with God's people. They had cloud readers. They would look at clouds, and they would just give this interpretation. These are the Jewish people. Uh, all the cold powers. Jesus said, it's not going to happen. I will cut off from your cities and tear down your fortifications, cut off your sorceries, and I will cut off your fortune tellers. No more. I will cut off your carved images, your sacred pillars from among you, so that you will no longer bow down to the work of your hands. These idolatrous worship centers. In the north and in the south, Baal, Ashtoreth. Um, I won't desecrate a, a Bible study to tell you what images that they, they created, uh, but phallic symbols, all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, you know, in the shape of a woman's private part, in the shape of a man's private part, and all these things, all done among God's people. 
because they worshiped like the Canaanites. The Canaanites did that. They brought it into Israel, and they said, well, this is our God. This is how we worship. Occult practices. And I don't think it's just the Jews. <laughs> There's plenty of occult practices within the church. Tremendous occult explosion. People thinking prophecy. It's clairvoyance. People doing all kinds of spiritual gifts that they think it's spiritual gifts, but it has nothing to do with spiritual gifting or the Holy Spirit. It's a different spirit, and you see it. It takes too long to explain, but you see it in many, many churches. I hate to describe it this way, but many Pentecostal churches have embraced, and I, I believe in Pentecostalism, and I believe in the gifts of the spirits, uh, practice for the church today. But most of what happens in that circle, in those circles, it's not really the Holy Spirit. This is a complete occult powers, this clairvoyant ideas, and uh, you see the Beth Bethel and Bill Johnson and all this stuff, they're only doing is practicing occult practice. That's all it is. It's, it's among God's people. It's not to say that it doesn't happen. Verse 13, I will cut off your carved images. Verse 14, I will root out the Asherim. Asherim were just these figures, these, uh, these uh, carved images, women, right? There were women and uh, there were carved images, and archaeologists have found tons and tons and tons of this. And, and, and you know, talk about pornography in the ancient times. There were just pictures of uh, basically pornographic material in carved images. You know, a man, a woman, private parts, and things like that. This was, you go, what is this, what is this doing among God's people? But they were. And yet, it's happening today. It's happening today with God's people still. God says to Israel, enough, I will cut them out. Verse 15, and I will execute vengeance and anger and wrath on the nations which have not obeyed. God's rule is going to come. Verse 14 describes the day that Jesus will rule and reign. There will be a tremendous joy and celebration among God's people, but there will be a dreadful time for unbelievers. The execution of God's judgment is going to be undeniable. The future is going to, it's, it's unveiled to us today. Disobedience is going to be met with severe punishment. No one will ever get away with anything after that. <laughs> right now, God has allowed a time of disobedience for his own purpose and his own time. He has allowed a time of disobedience for people to live in sin but not to the point where if something happens, if someone sins, God will automatically deal with them. He's patient. He's patient with them and allows them a time to repent. Why hasn't God judged this world yet? I don't know why. If I were God, I would have done something else. But then again, I would have wiped myself out too. <laughs> but there's, a time, there's coming a time where it's going to be no more tolerated. There will only be righteousness. Only be righteousness. It will be a righteousness that will be bring about a day of anger and of wrath on the nations which have not obeyed, right? It's not on everybody. It's on the nations which have not obeyed. The future is unveiled, clear. We've seen it. What does it mean to us today, 2017? Some people look at it this way and say, well, you know what, what's the point? God said it's going to happen, so we just, you know, <laughs> it's going to happen. We're just going to die. We're just going to be judged. That is what many people have today called fatalism. You know, God is sovereign. He's going to make it happen anyway. We have no choice. It's over. However, God is sovereign, but not in the way you would describe it as fatalistic. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows the future. He knows what's going to happen. He knows that he is watching over history, and it'll happen the way God has proclaimed it. No doubt. Everything you read here will happen exactly the way God said it. Israel will be back into the land. Israel will be spared. God will be given over as uh, God, God will give Himself over to them as a king. God will use the Jewish people. He will cut off their idolatry. He will cut off their immorality, and He will rule and reign. That's true. God will decide, but God gives people a freedom. God gives people a freedom to do something with it, not to change the future, not to change, you know, the idea of freedom. Some people think of the idea of God giving somebody free will. They go into the extreme idea that because of free will, we're going to change God. Like God has to do our thing. <laughs> God, you know, we have free will, so God has to do my thing. That, that, that's, that's a crazy idea of free will. That's not the way free will works in the Bible. Free will is the fact that God has determined history the way it's going to go, but he gives people an opportunity to be in it or out of it. <laughs> 
That's our choice. He gives the opportunity to participate in what he's done or to be not part of his future. That's the opportunity we have. In chapter 4 and chapter 5, looks at this into the future, and God says, this is my future. Do you want to be a part of it? Do you want to be a part of my kingdom or I will rule in righteousness? That's the freedom God gives to people. You can't change the future. God has already determined it. But in his will and mercy and kindness, you can change your future in relation to that kingdom. Do you want to be a part of that kingdom or do you want to be outside of that kingdom? Remember what it says in the New Jerusalem? The New Jerusalem will not, those inside and those outside are totally different and will not be allowed, those who are immoral, those who are idolatrous, the coward, right? This will not be allowed in the new Jerusalem. So yes, you can't change the future, but you can change your personal future by faith and repentance. You could be against the Lord today and God giving you that wonderful gift of freedom to choose to say, based on the repentance, based on the conviction of the Spirit, you can be born again. You can have the freedom. So to finish, this is he that keepeth Israel, right? Neither slumbers nor sleep. God's going to keep them. I'm going to keep this. I'm going to skip this slide, Chris. I'm going to go to this one. Three questions, and we're done. What do you think about the Jewish people? Big important question today. Big important question to ask the question in church. What do you think about the God of Israel? What do you think about the God of Israel? You know, you can't be saved unless you worship the God of Israel. All through the Old Testament, it's the God of Israel, the only one that can bring salvation. Well, that's the Old Testament God, right? That was a big thing in the, new, in the, new, in the early church. Oh, that's a new God. That's a different God. We like the God of Jesus, right? It's the same. He's the Lord and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he, he's the Old Testament. He's the Old Testament God. Yahweh, it's the same God. An ultimate question is, what have you done with the king of Israel? What have you done with the king of Israel? We know what Israel did with their king. Remember? New Testament, they rejected him. We know what they did, and you know what others have done with Jesus. But you, you can make a distinct decision for Jesus to trust him, to obey him, and to be under his rule. Because he's going to rule. You read the history. You read the, you read the future, I guess, future history. You know what God will do. The plan is laid out. Jesus will be king. The question is, will we, we, will we be part of his kingdom or will we be outside his kingdom? That's what Micah gives us. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your grace tonight. Be with us as we conclude our fellowship time, our fellowship and our love for one another, our love for you. Lord, I pray. You give us an opportunity to preach and, and share this message to those, Lord, who have ears to hear. We ask you, Lord, by faith, we would believe it. We will be trusting in you, Lord, all the way through that, that, Lord, there is a valley and there is peaks and there is another plane in prophecy, but there is an ultimate end. There's an ultimate goal. And that's Jesus as king. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, that you have allowed us Gentiles, Lord, to be part of the commonwealth of Israel, to be part of the Jewish people in faith. By faith, we are children of Abraham. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness and goodness. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us into your kingdom. And Lord, we pray that your kingdom will come and your will will be done. We see how it will end. We see how Micah, this, 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 this poor farmer, this, this gentle farmer who sees into the future by your spirit and says, there's a baby there's a baby born. His name will be Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. But he will be a king. He will be our peace. And he will uproot the ungodliness of Jacob. And Lord, we look forward to, until, uh, to have the Jewish people by us. To worship you, Lord, among the Jewish people. Lord, help us to pray for them. Help us to, uh, Lord, look forward until the day where they have their rebirth. Just like us, they'll be born again. We thank you, and we can't wait for the time where Jew and Gentile together in the Messiah, worshiping you in the new Jerusalem. In Jesus' name, amen. I bless you guys. Have a great evening.